I think uh, it's probably better to say that NMR chose me in the sense, as I recall it, when I was a graduate student in, an undergraduate student in Oxford, we had to do, uh, select a research project to do as part of our um, bachelor's degree. And my first choice was actually Peter Atkins, who at that time was doing research in quantum chemistry. And I'd had um, lectures from Peter Atkins and enjoyed them very much. So I think it's common that you want to go to join somebody who you enjoyed hearing lectures from. And maybe I was a little lucky because he just at that time decided to essentially stop doing research and start to write textbooks instead. And of course he became a fantastically successful textbook author. This is the Atkins Physical Chemistry series. So he couldn't take me, so then I had to look around for somebody else. And uh, I'd also enjoy some lectures from Ray Freeman. So I asked him if I could work with him, and uh, I did. Um, and that was the start of that. And I've been in the field ever since. Um, I think it was probably performing um, a spin echo. Um, and at that time, doing any experiment was quite, uh, you know, it was not so easy. You had to to program the pulses yourself, but this was done actually directly on the computer using octal machine code. So that means just strings of numbers from zero to seven. And um, I learned how to do that, but then once one was equipped with that knowledge, then you could essentially start to do any pulse sequence you wanted. And uh, I, uh, uh, um, it was probably um, Gareth Morris, or maybe Jeffrey Bodenhausen, who taught me about spin echoes. And um, I started doing that, and shortly after that, I learned that um, uh, you, there was also this problem with the radio frequency field being inhomogeneous as well. Um, the idea immediately came to me for this uh, three pulse sequence which became known as a composite pulse. And that was literally within about two weeks of my starting my undergraduate research project. Um, so I was also very lucky in that respect and I've been living off that ever since, more or less. I was working in the laboratory of Richard Ernst in Zurich and had decided to try to do some solid state NMR experiments. Uh, and it was natural for me at that time to try to do some composite pulse techniques in solid state NMR, since they, uh, nobody had really tried that before. And I designed um, an experiment which I thought should work for doing cross-polarization between protons and carbons, and, and which should be compensated for errors. Uh, and I programmed it, and I tried it, and it worked beautifully. Um, but what became clear as I um, started to work more on the experiment was that it was actually not doing the pulse sequence which I thought I'd programmed. I'd made an error. Um, technically there were two loops and I'd got the end of loop instructions exchanged. So I had two entangled loops which were doing something very peculiar. And it worked. And uh, in the end I managed to disentangle what it was actually doing. I managed to simplify that. And that became a variety of cross polarization. Uh, which became known as the moist cross-polarization experiment. And the original experiment, which I wanted to do, didn't work. So I was extremely lucky uh, in that uh, an error in pulse programming led to a, a fortuitous uh, discovery. Yes, this is a tricky question. Uh, I came very close to making a very big blunder that, um, in um, 
Southampton we attempted an experiment which involved illuminating the sample at low temperature immersed in liquid nitrogen and transferring that particular sample to the magnet inserting it into the spectrometer, into the magnet, into the probe and observing the proton NMR signal and the particular samples we were working with then we were hoping to see a hyperpolarization effect, an enhanced NMR signal. And we did. We saw a huge NMR signal. And um, got so far that I was uh, starting to write up the paper. And I decided I was going to be world famous for this experiment. Um, uh, but a little reflection decided we should do a few more checks. And it turned out that this enormous NMR signal was merely due to water condensing on the cold sample before it was inserted into the uh, NMR probe. And when it was done properly, then we saw no effect whatsoever. So I, I was probably within about a week of submitting a paper on that. But fortunately, just got away with it. I get advice from wide range of people, I would say, so I um, think I, there are some colleagues at, uh, at work and elsewhere who I admire very much by them for their good judgment, which I know is not my strong point, let's say, sometimes, um, so I, I take advice from them, but also very much from uh, my wife, who is full of good sense, and, uh, uh, and I always respect what she has to say. I think a figure I do find very inspiring is Noam Chomsky, who is um, a brilliant uh, theorist of linguistics at MIT. He's very world famous. Um, I had the good fortune to meet him um, a couple of times. Um, and he's politically very active and applies his uh, scientific skills, let's say, to political situations, and I admire that very much. But it's also quite depressing because you, you really can never match somebody like that. Um, I, um, my major interest, I guess, outside science is music. I play some music, I compose some music. Um, that's important to me. I, I enjoy that very much. One thing which does strike me when looking back was probably my first scientific conference and I don't remember where it was in fact but um, it was in the very early days of MRI um, and I remember strongly seeing a talk by one of the practitioners of MRI, I'm not sure who it was. Um, but they showed them that the results of an experiment in which an orange or lemon had been placed in the NMR magnet and some crude image was taken. And what I particularly remember is the whole conference laughing their heads off at the absurdity of putting something like a vegetable inside an NMR magnet, something completely unheard of at the time. And of course we all know what, how, what MRI went on to become. So. I would say this experience always makes reminds me that you should never do, not do something because it seems a bit foolish. Um, in fact, it's just those foolish experiments which often turn out to be the most important ones. I would say thank you. Um, given me a lot of uh, good experiences and companionship and um, um, to some extent they've always been there for me like a good old friend who you can keep coming back to and always has something new to say well I think we see at this meeting here Euromar 2018 that the field is very vibrant um, 
it's expanding in all sorts of new directions. It's maybe a different sort of NMR from the one which I made most of my career with in the sense that it's, the stress is not so much on methodology but on applications, interdisciplinary experiments involving other techniques as well. And I'm sure the field will continue to develop in that direction. Um, and I think it's a very healthy and, and very nice development. I also find working with other techniques than NMR very interesting and inspiring.